are rolling. Go for it. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Mack. Welcome to the 19th event in the Popular Books and Process series, a collaboration between the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPEN US, and the POP Conference. As always, thank you to my co-organizers, Eric Weisbart and Carl Wilson. Two weeks ago, we had a great conversation between Marie and Mann, Maya Angela Smith, and Francesca Royster about Black women in rock and country music. And next week, on November 17th, Kira Gaunt will be discussing her book in progress, Twerking at the Intersection, Collapsing Music, Monetization, and Violence Against Girls on YouTube. And in case you are unaware, you can find previous sessions on Eric Weisbart's YouTube channel. Today, we're excited to have Ryan Banyagale and Josh Dushan here, who will talk about their edited collection with Lexington Books titled, We Didn't Start the Fire, Billy Joel and Popular Music Studies, and they will be in conversation with Catherine Metz and Don Trout. Ryan Raul Banyagale, co-editor and author of the chapter, My Lives, Greatest Hits and the Arranging of a Career, is Director of Performing Arts and Associate Professor of Music at Colorado College. He received his PhD from Harvard University with support from the American Musicological Society's AMS 50 and Howard Mayer Brown Fellowships. His first book, Arranging Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blue, and the Creation of an American Icon, published by Oxford University Press in 2014, focuses on the ongoing and surprising life of Gershwin's iconic Rhapsody in Blue over the course of the 90 years since its inception. He is also the editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Arrangement Studies, also published by Oxford University Press. Josh Deshawn, co-editor and author of the chapter From Liverpool to Hicksville, St. Sgt. Pepper's meets the Nylon Curtain, is Associate Professor of Music and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Music at Wayne State University. An ethnomusicologist specializing in American popular music, he has authored two books, Powerful Voices, The Musical and Social World of Collegiate Acapella, published by University of Michigan Press in 2012, and Billy Joel, America's Piano Man, published by Rel Relman and Littlefield in 2017. Articles in American Music, the American Music Research Center Journal, Journal of American Folklore, Journal on the Art of Record Production and Rock Music Studies, and chapters in the Cambridge Companion to the Singer-Songwriter published by Cambridge University Press in 2016, Play It Again covers songs in popular music published by Ashgate in 2010, and Rethinking American Music published by University of Illinois Press in 2019. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan. Catherine Metz, Co-author of the chapter, Scenes from a Music Museum, The Music Man's, I'm sorry, The Piano Man's Notebooks in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology at the Oberlin Conservatory, where she's also charged with assisting and overseeing the musical studies program in the College of Arts and Sciences and creating programming to serve students across the institution. Metz joined Oberlin after nine years at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, where as the manager of community and family programs, she fostered sustainable relationships with community organizations and collaborated with community leaders in order to better serve their constituents' needs in connecting music and social justice. Don Trout, author of the chapter, Form, Lyrics, and the Short, Short, Long Pattern in Billy Joel's Music, is Associate Professor of Music Theory at the University of Arizona, Fred Fox School of Music. His work focuses primarily on the music of Igor Stravinsky, including his book, Stravinsky's Great Passacaglia, Recurring Elements in the Concerto for Piano and Wind Instruments, published by Boydell and Brewer in 2016. His publications also include analytic work on harmony and rhythm in rock music, with a special focus on how rotation and repetition interact within these parameters. After the discussion, there'll be a Q&A, which Carl Wilson will moderate, Please put your questions in the chat as they come to you, and Carl will find them there at the end of the discussion. So now I will turn things over to Ryan, Josh, Catherine, and Don. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, nice to see everybody here. Um, nice to see some former students of mine here. Shout out to Neil and Carrie. Uh, I'm Josh Duchan, and uh, Ryan and I are going to kind of kick this kick this thing off a little bit. A uh, bit of a Shameless plug, I have a flyer with a discount code. So if you haven't gotten the book yet, you can do it now or after or, you know, whenever it's convenient. I'll drop it in the chat as soon as I'm done talking because I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, 
Ryan, you want to uh, start us off with a bit of a prologue? Sure. Yeah, um, just thank you again uh, for the opportunity to share the, the book with you all. Um, you know, Josh and I had planned to, you know, go on the Billy Joel Stadium tour this last summer and give a pre-concert talk at every event, but that, that will just have to wait until the pandemic is over. Um, so we're now is just as good a time as any to share all of our insights with you guys. So thanks again uh, for having us. Um, you know, this is the, this book is the culmination of five years of a, of a project um, that began um, in earnest, you know, um, right after I finished my, my first book, the, the Rhapsody in Blue book that was mentioned um, in July, I think in July of 2015, was it Josh? Um, on Facebook, I kind of posted a tongue in cheek comment, cop, uh, you know, tagging Josh and a couple of others like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we had a Billy Joel conference? Um, never expecting that that would happen. Um, and then, you know, everybody jumped in immediately and said, hey, yeah, I'd love to, that should be great. Um, let's check it out. Uh, let's see, what, what can we do? What does it look like? And then I went to um, my a couple of funding sources here at Colorado College and I was like, you know, I kind of think we might want to do this conference on Billy Joel, what do you think? And assuming again, mm, no, no interest, but people really jumped in and said, yeah, let's go for it. So um, we were really kind of surprised um, at the, at the, interest, but also the kind of commitment behind doing some work about Billy Joel, who, you know, music we've all known for a long time, but has also not been a part of the, the um, scholarly literature in, in popular music studies or musicological studies. Um, as we, you know, we talk about this a bit in the introduction to the book, um, but everybody kind of knows this lacuna is there. And uh, Billy Joel's contemporaries, um, most notably, you know, some, like someone like Bruce Springsteen has had a pretty decent amount of scholarship. So here's the opportunity. Um, but also the, the, what we didn't know was how many kind of scholars would kind of start to come out of the woodwork um, and, and, and profess their, not only their insane knowledge of Billy Joel's music, but apply their own areas of interest and expertise to that approach. I mean, we only had in that initial, um, and Joshua, you can talk a little bit about the conference and how that all came together, but in that initial group, um, I would say only two dedicated Billy Joel scholars, Josh being one of them, um, and the rest of us all kind of people who had wanted to always engage with the music through our academic lens, but hadn't really had that opportunity. Um, so I don't know, Josh, you want to talk a little bit more about the origins of that conference? Sure. Um, well, we ended up with some very generous funding from, um, let's see, the American Musicological Society funded us some graduate student travel funding. Um, it was some NEH funds through Colorado College that helped us out quite a bit. Uh, we had um, some support, I think, from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, as well. And when it all came together in the fall of 2016, it was two days of Billy Joel mania. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many presenters. Did we have somewhere between, somewhere around 20 maybe? We had uh, 30 presentations total. Wow, we just added 10 more. Um, 30 presentations, like 300 people attending. It was, it was pretty exciting. Um, the goal really was to um, marshal diverse perspectives on Billy Joel's music while embracing the idea of public musicology. Of the 300 people who attended, I don't know, I'd probably guess that 250 of them had never studied music other than maybe, you know, some piano lessons or a choir at some point in school. Uh, so it was really nice to see such enthusiasm. Um, and it really, it, it forced us to be there when the rubber met the road and take our uh, very specialized training, uh, which came from a lot of different perspectives. I mean, we had lawyers there, we had uh, medical professionals there. Uh, it was it was pretty wild. Uh, but to take our specialized training and translate it into language that lots of people can access. Um, so, I mean, for me, some of the highlights were we had a, a film screening a documentary about uh, Billy Joel's groundbreaking uh, 1987 tour of Russia. Um, we had some great performances um, by the students at Colorado College. Uh, we had the guitarist from Billy Joel's high school band on one of the panels, which was really great. Um, I think the highlight for me, Ryan, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel pretty safe doing so right now. But the highlight, I think, for me was the keynote event, which was the live interview with Billy Joel on the phone. 
Uh, and so we got to ask him some questions that the presenters had submitted. Uh, a couple of the questions that came up repeatedly in the presentations as well. And he was extremely supportive um, during that, that keynote. I mean, I think we tried to wrap it up and he was like, no, no, please ask me some more questions, uh, which was great. Um, so we, you know, we all gradually came down off the high that was that conference. And once our feet reached the ground again, Ryan and I kind of turned to each other and said, okay, what's next? Uh, and so we didn't start the fire. Billy Joel and Popular Music Studies was born. Uh, and to me, the goals of the book were to take those uh, public musicology conference presentations uh, and tweak them for uh, a more, the more specialized audience in our fields, um, while at the same time expanding that scholarly literature on Billy Joel. Um, and we realized pretty early on that that project could serve as a model to others for how one can study popular music from a variety of different perspectives and learn a variety of things from those perspectives. Um, so, I mean, we have 10 chapters in the book, music history, music theory, music business, municipal branding, gender studies, museum studies, arrangement studies, whole slew of stuff. Uh, we have the introduction that Ryan uh, alluded to that he and I wrote new for the book and then a transcript of the keynote interview is the last chapter, uh, which is largely unedited. And our thought was we would supply this as a new raw primary source so that future scholars can work with this material. And, and a couple of chapters in the book also reference it, uh, but it's there for your interpretation. Um, Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the, the forward? Yeah. So. Um... One of the nice things about the ongoing connection directly to the artist through this work is that, as Josh mentioned, the interview we did at the conference, and then as we got this book put together, we made the ask to Billy Joel directly, hey, would you be interested in putting a forward together for the for the book? And he wonderfully agreed quickly um, and, and really, I think, provided a nice framework for us, um, for the book as a whole, um, you know, kind of going off of what he knew of the work that he'd seen from the conference as well as from some of the drafts of the chapters, um, putting together, um, you know, just kind of his thoughts, which we were trying to, you know, we'd like to get him to talk more about his legacy, but he tends to not do that. He, um, and in this introduction, uh, this inter um, forward, he does kind of put that back on onto the scholars. He's like, you guys are the ones who can do, interpret my legacy and talk about it in the ways that you, you best see fit. Um, but that he's in that process is open to the scholarly interpretation and assessment of his work. Um, but that's where he's, you know, I think it's, I think it plays into on the academic side of things plays into the kind of legacy making phase of his career, which he's been in since the, since the 1990s when he stopped putting out albums and he's just been playing concerts and, and you know, keeping the music going. Um, the, um, I guess the big takeaways and conclusions from, from all the work that we've done in this, and then we can talk a little bit about some of the individual chapters. And I also would love to hear, um, have Catherine and Don talk a bit about their experience in the conference, as well as the process of adapting their work from this public musicology lens to the scholarly lens. Um, and then one of the things to throw out there for conversation perhaps is um, one of the realities and challenges that Josh and I faced in putting this book together, um, it, it was the, the was find, basically finding an audience and a publisher for the work that we had done in the conference, um, right? Like we had initially wanted to put out a book that was again, a public musicology book, but publishers had a hard time seeing, is this mass press trade kind of book or is it a scholarly book? And they didn't know where to place it. So we ended up ascending and going to a more scholarly academic press and location, which meant a rephrasing and reworking of a lot of the material that had been presented at the conference for an academic audience. And I think that's what an inherent tension in, in popular music studies is that, is that finding an audience and, and the, the, um, the directions and areas that the presses want to focus on or the, where they want to kind of push the, push the project as opposed to where the project kind of naturally lies. Um, I would love to hear actually lots of people's thoughts on that because that's just was kind of my experience in all of this. Um, the, but the conclusions for us in you know, putting this volume together um, was that there's actually a, a a lot more to be learned from, I think, Billy Joel's music and career than we had even imagined as, as you know, fanboys growing up in the 80s and playing the music and, and, and you know, listening and trying to figure out how it all worked. 
Guilty. Is, yeah, Josh Hood. Oh. Guilty, as charged. <laughs> but there's also this, you know, this um, depth of perspective that I think comes through in the volume, but also um, doesn't emerge as fully as it did necessarily even at the conference. Um, as Josh mentioned, we had um, a, a wider range of scholars approaching the music from different perspectives, including literary studies as well. Um, but again, part of that publishing problem I just mentioned was we had to kind of focus it in on music studies, music history, music theory, which I think limits the actual breadth of the diversity of approaches that we've got in here um, in this final product. But there's a lot to be learned and still a lot more to be learned you know, from, from his music. Um, you know, I think we, what these essays do as a set is kind of augment the prior um, history and theory-focused scholarship, um, some of which Josh has made significant contributions to. But a lot of Billy Joel's, um, what we have published on Billy Joel is in bio biographical form, a lot of anecdote, a lot of um, just narrative, and not so much digging into the music itself. Um, and that's what, what, uh, what Joel said in the, in the foreword. He says, you know, to me, music is the primary language. And for him, that's actually the, the first first issue uh, or first part of what he does in the creative process. He, if he doesn't have music that he likes, he's not going to write lyrics that he likes. And that was an interesting takeaway for, um, for the volume as a whole, maybe even at the end of the process was that, you know, I think we all know his lyrics, people take issue with his lyrics and say they're either, you know, could be more and more, more deep or more in depth, but it's, for him, it's the music that's the, that's the message, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, Josh, other, other, other conclusions you wanted to, to mention? I would just, add that well a there's one exception to that process which is we didn't start the fire ironically becomes the you know pre-colon part of our book title uh, but i would add one other conclusion that i think we can draw from the collection as a whole uh, and that is that despite a history of some critical derision um, billy joel's music and career really do deserve probably a more central place in the historical narrative of post-war American popular music. His life maps really neatly right onto that history. He's born in 1949. He grows up in one of those tract housing suburbs. Uh, you know, he lives through Beatlemania, and I'll talk a little bit about how that affected him, and so on. Uh, so I think as, as we continue to study those decades, that part of the 20th century, uh, I think his music has a lot to teach us. And maybe this book argues for uh, giving him a place in that narrative. Thanks, Josh. Um, I, I'd like to you know, turn to, to, to Don and to Catherine a little bit now and maybe let you talk a little bit about how you came to the project as a whole, you know, both the conference and then um, maybe give us some background on your, your particular chapters through your areas and lenses of expertise, as well as um, you know, maybe talk a bit, maybe a bit about that, that that transformation from the public to the the, the scholarly in, in terms of the work that you've you've generously provided this this volume. Um, Don, Catherine, which one of you wants to jump in? Catherine, you should go first, don't you think? <laughs> That's me. Street will be over soon, so. <laughs> I could go. I could go either way, um, but I but I, I see where you're going with this, especially with what you were talking about, um, Ryan, about the the music coming first, or Josh, whoever said the music first and then sort of the lyrics second, because um, we, my my former boss, <laughs> Jason Hanley, and I came at this from from the Rock Hall because um, so at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it, it's it's interesting because the the education department is kind of like a mini little pop music scholar department. There's musicologists, stuff, musicologists, sociologists, like we all just kind of anthropologists. We all have an interest in, in pop music and come at it from, from different angles. Um, and, you know, I no longer work there, but I'm still very close um, with, with my former co-workers and, um, my, and my former boss, Jason, uh, is number one, I should go ahead and, and say it's from Long Island. So he was born with um, Billy Joel in his blood. He had, he could, he, there's no, he, he can't escape it. Um, I, on the other hand, am not. Um, but I'm from the United States of America, therefore <laughs> I'm well familiar with Billy Joel. But the thing at the Rock Hall is that there are always conferences on all kinds of, on Prince and on Bowie and on metal, on all these different things. And there hadn't been one on Billy Joel. And 
and and there's not time to do all of the things plus a lot of times if we're invited to participate or if we see something so many people it's, they're not really that interested in what we have to say they're more interested in what the rock hall has or what the rock hall has to say um and we can't represent the rock hall as scholars it's that our scholarship is sort of our independent thing um but what was really compelling about the Billy Joel um, conference is that the fact that we have, the Rock Hall has so many of his, note, I think almost all of his notebooks that um, he would write his lyrics and sort of get his arrangements together for. And, and we were like, oh my gosh. And we had already been having very heated, sometimes um, perhaps aggressive <laughs> conversations about um, what artifacts can do for listeners and audience members, because a lot of people are like, oh, the Rock Hall, it's just memorabilia. Um, it's, it's just whatever. And other people are like, oh my God, it's so-and-so's whatever, guitar or lyric sheet or whatever. And there's, and there's, a, there's a spectrum on how and what artif music artifacts can do for, for one, for somebody. And because we already knew, like, I mean, Josh and I have known each other for years, because we already knew so many of the scholars who were involved in this project, we're like, oh, this would be amazing because this is the perfect uh, intersection of the Rock Hall's fan base and, and people who are loyal to the institution or who are, or are critical of the institution, as well as our scholarly interests, um, as well as thinking about, we can actually take the idea of these artifacts that we happen to have and really um, interrogate them a bit as sort of static objects, but also as these things that are actually are, have so much kinetic potential. It's just, a, it's just a piece of, it's just some pencil or pen on a piece of paper, but it's like what it, the practice and the composition and the action and everything that it inspires and sort of can can tell the story of felt like a perfect opportunity. So it really was a, was a great time. It was a, it was a perfect moment in confluence of so many other conversations and other things that were going on. So that's really why. Plus, I mean, you know, Jason Hanley is is a pretty diehard <laughs> Billy Joel fan. I'm I have to go ahead and admit I'm just an average Billy Joel fan. I'm just I'm, a, I'm the middle of the road Billy Joel fan. I don't know the deep cuts, <laughs> um, but I but I, I but I do. I, I grew up on his music. I mean, I was born in 1978, so you can kind of see where my framework is. But I think um, with in terms of the thinking about the public to the scholarly, it's it's interesting because I had so many friends. My um, my ethnomusicology friends were like, oh, okay, that's nice. There's another conference. But it was so many of just my friends in my life and my friends through the Rock Hall and my music friends who were like, oh my God, a Billy Joel conference. Are you kidding me? Can I go? Can I do? How do I do? What do I do? Blah, 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 blah. And then when this, when this, when I, when I, this book uh, came out and when it was delivered to my door um, and I, I just sent it around to a couple of friends like, oh, look, this, the thing that I've been working on for a while is here. I had friends who I didn't realize were such uh, Billy Joel fans who went out and got it right away because they were they're so committed because his music is really um, the music as well as the lyrics but the, the music content especially is is so inspiring for so many people as a cultural touchstone in the United States but also in terms of someone who is so interestingly open about his process and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen briefly I don't want to talk too long I want to give Don a chance to talk here but I think what's neat is um, that that the Rock Hall has we have happen to have all, so many of these images. There was a bit of a, a thing when you're working with, with live artists who are still have careers or are still just alive in general, they have, they have varying uh, interpretations of the Rock Hall and of whether or not their work should be there and whether it should be in a museum. Like Bob Dylan, for example, is notorious. He doesn't want anything in a museum because he's like, I mean, I ain't dead yet, right? Whereas Billy Joel is like, here's all these things, like you can figure out how to interpret them. And I love that connection because it takes the popular and it takes the scholarly and that takes the fandom and it kind of just puts everything at this really great nexus. And so this is just one example. Um, we, Billy Joel's people and the Rock Hall, Billy Joel's people really want all of these to be fully digitized, which is, if any of you are familiar with archival work, is, is, a, is a thing, it's a process and a project and it takes money and, and time. Um, and labor and, and it's something that we couldn't do in time. So they were kind of like all or nothing. So we were given permission to use a few things, but I thought today since um, we're not using this for profit or anything that I could share just one sheet um, that I, I love this because this demonstrates I think everything that I've been talking about. This is so exciting for a fan who's like, oh my gosh, this is Billy Joel's hand handwriting. This is his penmanship. This is 52nd Street. This is this album. But then there's this and this is one of my favorite pages in all this. And yes, we have favorite pages because I like that there are these notes of this, this, these phone numbers written down. Clearly one was written down at a different time as the other one because one is in a ballpoint pen ink and the other is in sort of a, a, a felt tip pen or a Sharpie and it's bleeding through and clearly someone had 
put a coffee or a drink or something or spilled some water on it and you can see how through the through the other side there's a reworking of the track listing and i just think there's something so compelling about how to be a detective and i'm not a musicologist i'm an ethnomusicologist i'm more of like an ethnographic person like i like going and talking to the people i'm not like look at the score person um i don't fully understand that approach uh, or I didn't at least until looking at this. And that also goes to show that I'm clearly way more into popular music than any other music. Um, because I just think that this is completely fascinating. All of the layers that you can peel back to find out, to think about the process and what Billy Joel was doing. And I think that's where this is such a wonderful ex uh, like um, intersection between the public and the scholarly, because I think anyone can appreciate that. Like a scholarship nerd can go down that train and be like, whoa, ah, what did he do? How did he mean? What, did, what, did, what does this go? And they, can, and they can play the detective and they can bring in you know, the theoretical and they can bring all these other things, but then the fan can come at it with an equally critical perspective that will actually likely bring things that the scholar didn't even, uh, didn't even occur to them, especially because the fan is like, well, obviously that track goes after that because it flows. So of course that makes sense. And I'm like, I'm not thinking about the flow. I'm thinking about, about how he wrote the arrangement over here and he scribbled this. And I wish there were a way to have the whole thing on, on display, um, sort of like if you've ever read the book, Ready Player One, like as in the Oasis, like it would be really neat. <laughs> you could just get to see it all. I mean, one day uh, with enough NEH funding and no pandemic, we can, we can get that together. But I think that was, that was why I was honored to be part of this is because it got, I got to talk about the artifacts and how they can come to life. Because when I first got to the Rock Hall, I'll be honest, Honest, I found it noisy and chaotic and I couldn't it was hard for me to see through the noise to find the, the, the kinetic power of objects so I will end with that and pass it on to Don <laughs> oh well yeah uh, thank you uh, thanks for hosting this event and um, it's it's good to see you all uh, yeah I have such fond memories of that of that conference I can't believe it's been four or five years ago already now um, I uh, I got into this um, as well. I mean, lifelong Billy Joel fan. I would say uh, certainly not. No, nothing more than the hits really until the last five or six years, probably. But certainly, um, you know, knew the hits all along. And um, uh, about I suppose six years ago. I was part of an interdisciplinary um, research team studying earworms of all things, songs that get stuck in your head. And uh, as the music theorist on the, on the team, my job was to analyze the, the songs that people reported as having stuck in their head uh, and see if there was any kind of structural similarity between them that could be pulled out and at least you know suggested that it's a pattern that is conducive to getting a song stuck in your head and um uh we you know it, it was a pretty small we just did it right here in tucson a few of a uh, few colleagues and i and i think we had 150 or so songs that were submitted we, you know we we did some radio we did a survey an online survey and and things like that. And um, about 40% of the songs that people reported had this pattern, short, short, long, uh, as a primary part of the song. Maybe it's the chorus or maybe it's kind of, you know, the, the way the verse begins. So short, short, long simply um, means like a one to one to two ratio, uh, a, a, a short, um, passage, re uh, repetition of that passage or something that's, you know, exactly the same length and very similar. And then a longer one that's, that's the same length as the two shorts added together. So, um, so if you think of like, uh, let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. That's a, that's a real clear one. That one was certainly on the list. Um, tried to run, tried to hide, break on through to the other side. Another, you know, um, really clear example of this idea of short, short, long. And I remember that uh, You May Be Right was, was, on, was on the list. Friday night I crashed your party. Saturday I said I was sorry. Sunday came and trashed me out again. Okay, so short, short, long. And that was, that was on the list of, of reported earworms. And so 
you know, we, we did our, we did our um, earworms project and, uh, and it was, it was good. And then we got some good mileage out of it, but then the call for papers for this Billy Joel conference came from, from Ryan and Josh. And um, I really wanted to be a part of it. And, and I had a feeling that, you know, this short, 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 long work was kind of, was my way in, especially since, since it was, you know, kind of a conference with a public, a desire to have the, the, a public angle rather than, uh, you know, kind of the music theory or a, uh, uh, musicology. Uh, they, I'm not sure they would be that interested in hearing about um, short, short, long patterns in today's pop music. But um, so uh, this allowed me the chance to uh, kind of dig in in earnest, looking for go hunting, as music theorists sometimes tend to do, uh, for these patterns in in Billy Joel's music and what you know what um, role does it play in his in his songwriting, and uh, and uh, you know, spoiler alert, um, there's quite a few. I'm going to share my screen now uh, just real quickly to. Uh, give you a sense of of what I found. Um, here's my table one and it's just, I've, I don't know, I I call this the, the shock and awe kind of, I, I just like to, when, when I'm claiming that something is sort of pervasive in a particular uh, artist or composer, I, I just like a bunch of examples, you know, we're not, I wouldn't play them all, but here's a bunch of examples all the way spanning his entire career um of short short long patterns and so um you've got uh, she can kill with a smile she can wound with her eyes and she can ruin your faith with her casual lies obviously scenes from an italian restaurant is a really clear one um just the way you are this one i've actually speaking of uh, music coming before lyrics i've heard him in interviews he'll give this as an example uh, of how he he got that tune, um, yeah, da, da, da. and and you know he's like, and when when you first for him anyway, when you first get the tune in your head, you you might give it some words just so that you don't forget what the tune is if you don't have your uh, Walkman tape recorder uh, nearby as it probably was, and so I, I still remember him. Uh, don't go crazy because you're lazy or something, you know, something just trying to remember the words, but um, definitely music before lyrics for him, other than we didn't start the fire. Um, Close the shop, sold the house, bought a ticket to the West Coast. So there's just uh, a bunch of examples um, right up front. And so then for me, the, the task was to, um, well, so I, I shared these findings and kind of connected it to, um, kind of connected it to uh, other short, short, long patterns in in the spoken. You know, um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Um, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. So it's you know this pattern is out there in in the world at large, and Billy Joel certainly taps into that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I left things for the conference was sort of that it obviously plays a, a big role in his, in his, um, songwriting. And it's also part of something that we, that we see in culture, but for, in transitioning to the, you know, to kind of crank up the nerdiness, I guess, or something for the, for the collection of essays for the chapter, um, it, it well it's clear that this short short long pattern has a close affinity to something in music theory called sentence structure um and sentence structure is a it's a formal pattern like a, a way to put music together that's been around for well composers have been using it, at least since Haydn Mozart Beethoven and um music scholars have been discussing it for decades, um, Schoenberg, so yeah, a hundred years probably. And um, so it, you know, th that gave me a nice in with Billy Joel because as we know, he took classical piano training as a child. Uh, 
he still talks about his reverence for the classic classical tradition, especially Beethoven. Uh, I actually think there's there's kind of a Bloomian anxiety of influence kind of thing going on between him. I mean, have you heard like when he gives these interviews, he'll he'll have this thing. Oh, Beethoven goes out for and gets drunk, and and then he goes over to his keyboard and kind of plays. Uh, the Eroica Symphony in C minor instead of in, 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 or in C major instead of E flat major. And, uh, but, you know, he clearly knows a bunch of, of the music and, um, and those traditions. And so uh, it, it made for a way for me to kind of connect um, uh, his, his music and his incorporation of short, short, long and tie it to this larger thing that's definitely a, a major topic in my field. So uh, that was kind of my in um, and um, pretty happy with the outcome. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the collection too. So um, that's, yeah. Thanks, Don. Um, and thanks, Catherine, for, for talking a bit about that, that process. I think what I, I like about, appreciate about what you've just shared with us for the group is what I think is, is true about the volume, which is that it, it you know, it has these kind of nitty gritty academic things that we all get super excited about in our own work, whether that's hunting down those, you know, sentence structures or um, digging into the, you know, the individual aspects of performance and, and, you know, the process of change over time. But then it draws out to these larger considerations of, of not just popular music as a whole, but that a lot of um, the, the more general public is interested or aware of, like earworms, right? That's something that we all are interested in and want to know more about. Um, the idea of peeling back layers to tell someone's history or story and understanding the depth of what you can get from something is really an interesting common theme. And I guess that's what I, I, I in putting this all, this whole volume together, I'm really pleased with seeing is the ways that these different chapters, because they were born out of this public discourse um, for the conference, have this very academic lens, but still have a, a, an application um, to, to public uh, interests and, 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 and non-scholarly realms in ways that I, I have, I, I see sometimes, I think we, we, all, we all strive in our scholarship that, that we can make those connections, but I'm not sure if we, we always succeed in that. And so I'm pleased that that, you know, taking the, the root of this from, we wanna communicate clearly to an audience that's not music scholars, um, and then shoring that up with the academic work behind it has been a really interesting process. I know for myself, um, I'm not sure if, you know, if Josh or Don or Catherine want to add to that. Well, actually, Ryan, I, I was going to ask you about that because it seems to me that your chapter is also a really good example of academic work meeting a non-academic audience. It's about albums and uh, releases of recordings, and, and you can tell us more about it in a moment when I finish figuring out what my question is. But I think the, the things that you talk about, the objects, the artifacts that you talk about, Ryan, are the things that I'm guessing most people encounter Billy Joel with or through. Um, maybe you could Tell us a little bit about you know your chapter and and riff on that for a moment. Sure. Um, so the the, you know, the chapter that I put into the book and that is, came, came out of the conference is about um, Josh said is about um, compilation albums and greatest hits albums and um, and I you know my broader area of interest and work is in. Um, well, I'm finding actually I'm doing a lot of work in, in piano playing songwriters um, with Hirschman and Billy Joel and a, a for, you know, upcoming project on Ben Folds. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in arrangement studies and how ha the concept of arrangement writ large across music um, and music studies. And so um, this was a chance for me to start playing with the concept of arrangement in terms of that side by side juxtaposition that emerges from um, from compilation albums and greatest hits albums. And as Josh alluded to, um, I mean, that's certainly the way that I first encountered Billy Joel was getting the greatest hits album um, one and two. And, and, and it was only later <laughs> as I, you know, dived fully into my, my Billy Joel nerdiness in high school that I got all the albums and kind of started going back through the catalog. Um, but that it is interesting, Josh, as you say, I hadn't really thought about that ne necessarily, but the, the point that you made that that is how people tend to encounter 
Billy Joel or really any artist these days, right? If you're going to check out a new artist um, or someone says you should check out so-and-so, you're, you know, my default at least is to hop on Spotify and then it kicks up basically a greatest hits list of five or 10 tracks. And from there, you can decide which way are you going to peel off to check out the artist in greater depth or not based on what you've heard just in that glance. So there is something really telling about arrangements as they emerge from greatest hits albums. And it's not near necessarily as simple as these are the greatest hits. Um, this one of the things that I found in doing some analysis behind the data behind these songs on these um, greatest hits compilations is not all of them were, were number one, not all of them were the hits, um, some of them were excluded. And so the question of why, what, what was it about um, making a choice for one song versus another one um, that ultimately gives us this um, perspective, the sonic, uh, sonic perspective of Billy Joel um, at different points in his career, right? Greatest Hits Volumes 1 and 2 came out in the mid 80s um, when he was at the kind of the height of his fame and celebrity. And then the other compilation album that I look at is called My Lives, which came out in the 2000s. Um, just before resurgence of his touring and kind of coming back into the public eye with placements of his music in, in you know, TV shows and films again. So it's a, um, it is an interesting, interesting thing to think about that the objects that we're using for, for these, these, these um, moments, for, I guess for all the different chapters, that they do have this very public um, interface to begin with. And I think that's, I'm gonna turn it back to Josh here, is that's kind of where you go with your chapter as well. You take one of the most well-known albums of all time, <laughs> not by Billy Joel, and put it in dialogue with one, with one by Billy. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, Ryan, I, I, just off the cuff here, something that I hadn't thought about before is we do go to Spotify and YouTube and similar kind of social musical media in order to learn about an artist that a friend is recommended or whatnot. But at the height of Billy Joel's career, you didn't have those options. You had only the options that had been prepackaged for you, which I think makes I, I, two things come out of that in my mind. One, let's see if I can remember them both. One is we don't have as much control over what we hear. Uh, and I don't remember what the second thing was. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, oh, it, it places, this, is, this was it. It places him, Billy Joel, in, at a particular point in the history of the music business and music technology in, in the late 20th century there. Uh, and placing Billy Joel at a particular point in history is really what's happening in my chapter. My chapter is about you know, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band meets the Nylon Curtain. And of course, Sgt. Pepper's is the Beatles album, 1967. The Nylon Curtain uh, is Billy Joel from 1982. And I argue it's his most ambitious album. I mean, he, earlier on, he would kind of wrap up the principal recording and then let the producer take it from there. But as he told me in interviews for the Nylon Curtain, he had to actually stay in the studio to make sure that his vision you know, is what comes through on the records. So the the basic premise of my chapter coming out of the presentation uh, was that he admits pretty readily that the, that the Beatles were a pretty strong influence on him and his music and his songwriting, like a lot of Americans. I'd say most Americans at the time, seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in February of 1964 was a transformative moment. That was his first time kind of meeting them, so to speak. Um, and up to that point, I mean, he was basically, music to him was a little bit of Elvis, a little bit of R&B on the radio, but mostly just classical piano lessons. Uh, and this, this changed it. I mean, it was the images of girls screaming. Maybe that's what changed it. And he thought, if I can get that kind of response out of music, maybe I should do music. Um, but also the, the musical content as well. So that's a big influence. And he's upfront about that. Lots of interviews have, have talked about that. And then some of the scholarship that is out there, especially uh, maybe not the scholarship as much as the biographies, make a lot of hay, so to speak, out of the Beatles influence on Billy Joel. But what I found lacking and what my chapter tries to provide are some more musical details so that we can go from the generalizations of a, a magazine or a newspaper interview to actually substantiating those claims 
with musical details drawn from both albums and songs from both albums. So, you know, my, my chapter takes a look at lyrical themes and formal designs and, and it, it spends a little time discussing the narrative of escape, for example, which is present in both albums. I mean, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the whole premise of the thing is that we're not hearing the Beatles. We are hearing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This is, I'm sure, not news to everybody listening. Uh, similarly, I mean, Billy Joel starts with Allentown, which also kind of signals what the album is going to be about. And Allentown is kind of, a, it's about Allentown, Pennsylvania, and the whole Lehigh Valley, but it's really meant to be about um, the industrial, the decline of American industry in the 1970s. And, and he sings repeatedly, it's getting very hard to stay, right? So, it, you know, like I, I kind of have to get out of here. I've got to escape. And then the reasons why that escape is necessary are played out over the rest of the album. Um, there's also some redemption. It's not all escape, but, you know, the Beatles sing by getting better. They don't really tell us why things are getting better. Uh, Billy Joel sings in uh, one of the middle tracks. She's right on time. It's actually the return of his lover that helps things to get better. To me, both albums share a lot of theatricality. The fact that Sgt. Pepper's is not just an album by the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, but it's framed as a live performance. We hear the crowd noise at the beginning. We hear them laugh. We hear them applaud. Uh, so there's a there's a theatricality to that. We get the reprise uh, of the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band song as the penultimate track. Um, in Billy Joel's album, we start out with Allentown, as I mentioned, but then we get at the very end, this track called Where's the Orchestra, which is set in a theater and kind of embodies on ver in very personal terms the, the confusion, the frustration, the anxiety that's been played out in most of the songs leading up to that point, uh, this disillusionment with the American dream, basically. Uh, and you know, Billy Joel uses a variety of devices to try to evoke the theater, but at the very end of the track, even when he's done singing about this, he uses the melody of Allentown, the first track, in the outro of this last track, and he puts it in the clarinet and the harmonica, so it's not even a rock band, um, in order to tie the whole thing together. So it makes them both albums kind of concept albums. And of course, Billy Joel's up front that, that he thought, in his words, he was going to go back and pick up where the Beatles left off. It's, it's one of the things that, that he told me. Um, I also spend a good deal of time writing about the use of technology, especially uh, double tracking technology, which the Beatles were really fond of, especially once they switched from two tracks to four tracks for their recordings um, in 64 with A Hard Day's Night. I believe there are 13 tracks on A Hard Day's Night and they double track the vocals on 12 out of those 13. So they're, they're really keen on it. But my argument is that Billy Joel is as well he kind of shifts the calculus from a question of, is this vocal going to be double tracked or single tracked? Are we going to hear kind of the, the dry voice or are we going to hear this odd kind of mechanistic quality that you get when you have two recordings of the same voice layered on top of each other sounding at the same time? And with Billy Joel, in a couple of his songs, we go from double tracked to more severely double tracked and uh, permit me to do a little screen share and maybe uh, play a little bit because my favorite example comes from his song Laura which is the second uh, song on the album and it's it's a real anxiety ridden song about this guy's frustration with a woman but also his desire for her. Okay so Hopefully we can see this, right? Good. And so here we're gonna, what I've done is I just transcribed some, some quick little snippets here, but where you have um, stems going up and down 
is where you have this really severe double tracking as opposed to just the regular double tracking beforehand. So he's taking a technology that the Beatles were really fond of and shifting it from are we hearing it or not hearing it to are we hearing it or are we hearing more of it for a greater effect. Passes on her painful information. Can we hear it? Okay, great. Passes on her painful information. Then these careless fingers, they get caught in her face. All her life has been one long disaster. Then she tells me she suddenly believes she's seen a very good sign. So, really, my argument is that there are musical reasons for this. It's not just in the, the lyrics, it's not just the narrative of the song, uh, but that he's playing with technology in subtle but innovative ways. Uh, and I, I conclude with a reference to Ingrid Monson's intermusicality, kind of an intertextuality of music, uh, which she defines as using music to both refer to the past, but also offer social commentary. And I think that this album in particular does a really effective job at that because it's a, obviously it's a reference to lots of Beatles stuff because there's so much Beatles stuff that, that shows up on it. But I think he's referring to maybe the optimism of the social movements of the past and commenting through his music on how by the, the late 1970s, the early 80s, when he's making the Nylon Curtain, the optimism of the 1960s has faded quite a bit. I mean, Woodstock was like 12, 13 years ago. Um, and those youthful dreams haven't always come true for everybody and maybe they won't, maybe they won't come true. So there's a, a lot of frustration and, and resignation there. Um, he's very open about how he was trying to sing like John Lennon because he was affected by Lennon's murder in 1980 and that finally there would be no more Beatles. It was over. Um, so there's a lot of resignation in that as well. So ultimately, this is an album in dialogue with the past. So I'm placing Billy Joel in a particular spot in history. So that's the, the nutshell version here. I think, you know, just building on top of that, I think that's what this volume, I hope, ultimately does is it puts him in a place of history right now. Like, you know, in 2020, or actually not 2020, because a lot of this stuff is 20 you know, 16 to 2018 um, in, in terms of, you know, the scholarly publishing timeline. And um, but one of the things I've been wrestling with and thinking about a lot right now is what is the relevance of Billy Joel in 2020? Um, how has, you know, how would this volume look if we were to start and put a public musicology conference together today? And what perspectives would we maybe have and include to leverage that, you know, understanding and depth of, of his role um, and his place of music in, in, um, you know, the, the late 20th century and into today, um, what would that look like now? So hopefully someone else will pick up that up that I, I'm not going to do another conference right now. Um, do we want to turn to some Q&A uh, questions? Oh, or Catherine, yeah, do you want to hey, jump in? Actually, if I may jump in, because Ryan, that actually tie, I think what you just said about how we would frame it in this particular year that has been the longest year in the world, and it's not even over, actually brings in, I think, Kimberly's question and, um, and uh, and Chris's question, sorry, on the chat, just thinking about um, part of his legacy, because I feel like now, you know, and we've all, we're zoomed out, obviously, and we're, and we're exhausted, and we're, you know, the childcare, and the thing, and the this, and the that, and the other, and, da -da -ba -da -da -da, and the depression, and the isolation, and all the things that we're all, the tropes that we are all dealing with on a regular basis, and we're always reading about self-care, and this, that, and the other, uh, but I think something that everyone can, can agree with is that we all need to be comforted, and um, Billy Joel for me is comforting. And I think that that ties into a little bit of what um, Kimberly and Chris were talking about in terms of his, the critical reception, because I teach at Oberlin, which is a school that is, if you have heard of this artist, then that artist is no longer worth it, right? It, it needs to be the most underground thing. And they know this about themselves and they make fun of themselves. But I've noticed recently in my history of rock class that a number of students are kind of shameless, this new word for me, Stan, I, I still don't fully understand the whole thing, but the, the stands of 
certain pop artists. And I have a few stan stands for like super fans for, um, for Billy Joel, for example, or Bob Dylan or Bruce Springsteen and, and things that I wouldn't expect from people who were born in, in 2002. Um, but I think that right now it's almost like it's okay. It's a little bit more okay to like the thing that may be seen as schlock. And there actually is a great chapter in the book about, um, I assign it to my students actually because it's so good. I did assign it to my students because it's so great thinking about taste and thinking about schlock and thinking about why we like what we like, which is just such a hard thing to define in pop music world. But I think that if, if, we, were to, if we were to really consider Billy Joel now in this conference now, I think the comfort of Billy Joel as as this person who can create these pop tunes that stick in your freaking head with the long, 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 short, I mean, the short, short, long. <laughs> Sorry, Don, right? There's something to that. And I feel like that kind of craftsmanship or craftspersonship, musically speaking, is something that a lot of us crave right now. I don't want to think too hard about my music. Um, and the thing about Billy Joel, I think it's very compelling, is that you can think very hard about it or not think very hard about it. You still get a lot out of it. And I think that's one of the things that's refreshing, especially right now. <laughs> Right. So that would be my sort of response also to kind of help us transition into those questions, which I think are really great because I love talking about I love talking about taste, schlock and bad music because I also my research originally focused on this pop cumbia in Peru that most people hate and all of a sudden now it's popular in the entire nation. And I'm yeah. like, y'all, please. <laughs> right. It might be a couple of years old, but I, I feel like I saw some information that said the for live shows in like, say, 2018, uh, the top 10 audience draws are people like Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel. Uh, it's, it's these kind of classic, you know, I mean, uh, of course, Beyonce and Taylor Swift are up there as well, but uh, there's, there's got to be something to what, uh, what Catherine is talking about that people just, you know, feel like they need to, I mean, he's still sold out at Madison Square Garden every month, right? A standing concert at, at MSG uh, for as long as he wants, uh, and uh, he, I think he's going to do it as long as people want to. So there's definitely, you know, he's tapped into something uh, with with the specificity of his lyrics that people can can attach to. Uh, a lot of them are about New York, so that's a few million fans right there sometimes as well. So, um, uh, yeah, he's he's definitely brought a lot of different things together without. I guess my one comment as the as the theorist, like the the short, short, long um, is a pattern that does occur in a lot of different music. And so one could criticize him and say, you know, that he's a hack because he's just falling into this short, short, long pattern. But one thing his music doesn't do in in most cases anyway, harmonically, it's not like a four bar harmonic um one to five to six to f it's not just a, a rep repetitive four chord uh thing that you you match up with a short short long in the lyrics and you know and that's what mo on the earworms chart that's what a lot of the songs were were these tunes with um uh the four bar harmonic pattern that was the setting for the for the short short long but bill that's you know one of the angles uh, my work ended up taking was his it puts the short short long into a larger kind of formal unit that is akin to what he grew up with in terms of Beethoven and, and Tin Pan Alley as well for sure so all right so why don't we uh why don't we start the Q&A we do have some questions in here Sarah Cohen did you want to unmute and ask your question Oh, hi. Um, hi, can you guys see me? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I got to run in a minute to take my six-year-old Billy Joel fan to piano lessons, but um, mm -hmm. I was really struck by uh, how heavy the like short, short, long concentration was in 77, 78, which um, is, you know, When the Stranger, which is my favorite Billy Joel album came out, right? And so I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts about what was going on with Billy Joel, you know, in his life or his music in 77 and 78 that may have contributed to this fluorescence of short, short longs, um, these like poppy songs that, um, that we become addicted to. Yeah. Uh, I, somebody else can chime in after I, after I say my spiel. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, uh, first of all, that, that chart is relatively ad hoc. I just, <laughs> I have not, 
I, I don't, I can't remember if I ended up making like a, just through every single album and every single chart. I know I didn't find a ton like Cold Spring Harbor, th those early albums don't have a ton of, of overt short, short, long references. But yeah, by the time you get to 52nd Street and The Stranger, um, he's, you know, kind of locked into something that he likes. And, uh, um, I, you know, I don't know if it is truly less prevalent in, his, in the later albums. I, I sense that it maybe is. As to why, I don't know, except for that's where he was as a songwriter right then. I don't know if there's any, um, anything. I mean, they were, you know, they were, these guys, well, I've heard him say, I've heard him talk about albums versus singles, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, yeah, he very much was, uh, all of the songs, at least somehow wanted them to be related to each other. And, um, and you're going to hear similar songwriting techniques in them. But, um, you know, I don't have a, like a, from his personal life connection that would, that would help explain that other than that's kind of where he was uh, in, in songwriting. So oh, that's super helpful. Thank you. Well, you know what, can I, may I piggyback on that briefly? Just a, a, a sort of a question in general, because I didn't realize I was born in 1978 and my parents were born in the mid forties, early mid forties. And so I was raised on oldies stations for my life for a long time. So that was from about Elvis, Chuck Berry-ish um, to about Motown uh, through the Beatles, right? Like that was the, the, the main chunk for a long time. And then eventually what I didn't realize until later was that Elton John and Billy Joel weren't oldies. Right, they weren't that old, like right, because the oldie stations started to transition from stuff in the fifties and sixties to the seventies, and now, well, now we don't. Radio doesn't really mean anything anymore, but uh, I mean it does. Eric Weiss fine, but uh, <laughs> it did it differently, right? So I think that um, it, it, it's because I, I assumed, and I was kind of surprised when I later discovered that Billy Joel had written some of the stuff in the you know in the in the late seventies and early eighties, because I just assumed it was from the sixties right and as a kid as a kid as a teenager and then person in their early 20s or something and i remember very distinctly being surprised by that and i think part of that has to do with that pop sensibility and the fact that some that some of his stuff is in dialogue with other albums right like for example what what, what josh was speaking to but once again i think that goes to how you how you what 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 is part of our aesthetic as as pop songs that capture our attention and i don't know i don't even know where i'm going with this but i was just thinking like i thought he was oldies right and then i was like surprised by that he wasn't and that was just anecdotally I think a lot of that has to do with radio play and, and other things as well but in the grand scheme of things that there's something there's something about that whether we can't necessarily identify specifically in those albums because the, your favorite album Sarah maybe what was going on but it's there's definitely you know he has his own aesthetics right and to what both of y'all Ryan and Josh were talking about in terms of when when he was born and what he was and wasn't listening to and what he was and wasn't inspired by If I can jump in there, Catherine, it's interesting because if if I'm arguing that the Nylon Curtain is in dialogue with um, Sgt. Pepper's, the very next album that he does um, is like a total tour through the 60s, purposefully. And he's like very upfront about it. So it is supposed to sound like oldies. Uh, it's just, it, you know, maybe that's something that the critics are upset with at the time but to him it's you know this this was homage but it explains to me why sonically it would fit right in so then why do people feel guilty about it or why do people think it's shocky because i completely agree with you because it makes so much sense it's so intentional and it makes so much sense for our early but then it's like people because they like the stuff from the 60s. Is it, is it because it's copying? Is it because it's not original? But it's like, it's also like, but it's singable in a different way. I mean, I'm, I've become, I've fallen more in love with Billy Joel since starting this project than yeah. I ever knew that I would. So on a side note, y'all. I, I made the mistake at the conference. I made the mistake at the conference of suggesting that it was his music videos that are to blame for Billy Joel having the schlocky reputation that he does because I just remember the Uptown Girl video and 
I remember interviews with him describing how much he just hated doing them. Like, this is not what I got into this business for. Uh, so I, I've often thought that that, but I mean, the, the people who talk about his songwriting do talk, I mean, you can hear, you know, you can hear the John Lennon song, you can hear the, uh, you can hear the Steely Dan influence, you can hear the uh, James Taylor, influence, you know, uh, so people do seem to think that he simply uh, takes influences from somewhere else and, and writes a song in that same style. Um, I, you know, I haven't thought that much about it beyond that, I guess, but um, that's where people are coming from in terms of the songwriting, I think. All right, um, Chris, Malafi, do you want to unmute? Hi, everybody. Um, I could go in so many different directions on this. As Catherine knows, first of all, I'd like to endorse Catherine's equation of Billy Joel as COVID 19's comfort music. Um, I specifically reached for him uh, for my Hit Parade podcast back in April, basically kind of my first pandemic episode after everything got locked down. I was in the middle of a March episode when we got locked down, but really the Joel episode in April was the lockdown episode, and I felt like I was basically giving everybody comfort food, um, and a lot of people told me that it was, um, and I'd gotten requests. The, the, my podcast has been around for about three and a half years now, and I'd gotten requests for years for a Billy Joel episode. Um, and I'm winding up to my thesis here. Um, for a long time, I resisted it for some of the same reasons you guys are articulating, that it felt too easy, that it felt like it could be perceived as pablum. And most of all, I wanted to avoid what I call a Chris Farley idea, where all you really do is the same. Remember when so-and-so did this? Wasn't that awesome? Like, you're not actually making a point. You're just stating the awesomeness of somebody. I didn't have a thesis on Bill and Joel. And when the thesis, and several of you, Joshua, Don, even Catherine, are all kind of rolling around on it is the idea that, um, if I can summarize it in 15 words or less or whatever, uh, Billy Joel is not the piano man, he's the pastiche man. Um, and first of all, because my podcast is about the charts, little interesting fact, Billy Joel has three number one hits, not a single one of them, the piano is the primary instrument. It's still rock and roll to me, tell her about it, we didn't start the fire. Piano is buried in the mix in all three of them, but piano is not the reason those songs exist. So the idea that Billy Joel is Mr. 88 Keys is kind of overstated, and it's been overstated for a long time now. Um, and what makes him interesting is how he openly, shamelessly borrows tropes, and you're meant to notice them. When he does Say Goodbye to Hollywood, which is what, 1975, and he goes, you're meant to go be my baby. You're, you're, he's not hiding that. He's, he doesn't, he wants you to notice that. The whole record is structured like a girl group record. Um, so where am I going with this? I, I guess the, 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 the core of the question I asked earlier was it, whether, whether we agree that there has been critical reappraising of Bill and Joel. I track it in the last decade to uh, a Nick Poundgarten mega profile of Joel that ran for something like 8,000, 10,000 words in the New Yorker back in like 2014, 15, when the Madison Square Garden residency began. And it really took him quite seriously. And, and you know, Joel as punching bag has been the longest story in the book with him. And I, and I, I appreciate that Catherine is really trying to force all of us to say, okay, but what is it musically if it's pleasurable and there are other 60s acts that do it. I totally agree with you that Joel was somebody who sounded like oldies before oldies were oldies. What is it about Joel's brand of schlock that makes him unacceptable? And, and okay, if we agree that there has been a critical reappraisal, and I think there has been, what do we account for that? My sense is it's, I'm gonna say the P word that gets said on every popcorn thing, pop, some kind of optimism that's rearing its head and making Joel not, you know, as, this is not a word, belittleable as he was 20, 30 years ago. But I don't know, I could be wrong about that. So I throw that out there and anybody who wants to take it. And of course, I have to, unfortunately, depart. Oh, bummer. I know, right? Because the kid has to eat the food. Because kid. Because <laughs> human being. I'm so sorry. Human being. Thank you. Okay. And Bye, Catherine. Who's taking that? I want to know. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, 
I, I'll just, all I want to say is that, and I don't know if this would have anything to do with his critical reappraisal, but uh, I have a good friend here. It's a friend of Ryan's as well that is addicted to the Billy Joel Sirius FM station. And uh, apparently, in addition to the, the tracks, they play clips of him talking about his songs and, uh, and all kinds of different, you know, behind the scenes um, stories and things like that uh, on that. So I don't know if just having something like that devoted to this artist where everybody already knows the music, but they're now they're hearing some of that. I don't know if that would play into it. But. I think it's a, it's a good point, Don. I think that the, I mean, I know that every, you know, this, the Sirius XM Billy Joel channel, it kind of comes, comes and goes, right? They've got a you know, couple months run of it and then they disappear and then they rerun it again. And every time it reruns, someone emails me, oh, have you heard this Billy Joel Sirius XM thing? You know, and I think, I think, I think we all probably get similar emails about that from our, our loved ones. But um, the, but I think you're right. I think one of the things that's also led to this reappraisal, perhaps, Chris, um, is yeah, that, you know, he, I think he's been, he's been kind of under the radar talking about his work for the last 15 or 20 years since he stopped making albums. Um, I think Sirius XM is the most prominent version of that now, but he, for a long time, was doing these tours of college campuses, right, and sharing, um, you know, we see the occasional viral video of random student getting to live out their dream of playing piano while he sings the song with them. But he does those, mo you know, those lectures, talking about the music, connecting it to his stories and his past, and I think that's one of the things that I'm really interested in right now, and this was what I was starting to get at in, in, in my essay, was just that, that reappraisal of his narrative of his work that he's set in place so firmly through the existing biographies and the interviews that he's given. Now we've got a chance to really push back against that through the lens of the music in ways like, like Catherine was articulating, and that we can get at, as we all know, we can learn a lot from the music, and when we think about it in these different different ways in different directions. So that's perhaps maybe another reason. Um, certainly, you know, his songs have had a pretty prominent placement in a couple of hit movies in the last few years as well, if I'm not, not mistaken. Ryan, I would just add to that that he is definitely on board with the reappraisal. When I uh, interviewed him at his home on Long Island, that when was that now, 2015? Uh, as, it, as he was leading me back to the front door to kick me out gently um, because he wouldn't let me move in, uh, he, you know, I, he said if I had more questions, I should contact his people, they'd get in touch, yada, yada. Um, but that if I had come along a couple of years earlier, he wouldn't have been interested in talking about the musical details. You know, why, why did you modulate to that key there in that song? Uh, but that he was at the point where you know, it, he's ready to talk about that sort of thing. So uh, to me, that's, you know, primary source is ready <laughs> to be a source um, for that sort of legacy making stage, even though he didn't want to talk to us about it later. You know? Well, and also there's the fact that he's this rare pop star, mega pop star, unlike Springsteen, unlike Paul Simon, unlike other peers, who has a finite end date. He does River of Dreams in 93 and then he's done and he resists all entreaties. He'll play live, but nope, not interested in another pop album and it's been 27 years now. So I don't know, maybe 27 years is the amount of time it takes for him to say, yeah, okay, I'm willing to do an interview with you about my technique. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. He's asked, a, he's asked a lot, you know, why, why no more albums? And his answer is often, it's really hard work. Like, he doesn't actually enjoy writing. And I don't remember, I think he told us that at the conference. So it's in the, it's in the book um, that he doesn't enjoy writing as much as having written. And, yeah, I can relate to that. But, but also, he, at this point, maybe he, he doesn't need to. All right, so we have uh, one more question because I'm, I'm going to skip mine because I think it more or less got answered. Um, Neil Warner, do you want to? Yeah, so I was, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for the great presentation. It's uh, wonderful to be still learning from two of my past professors and, and Ryan, I've read a lot of your work as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here and for the great presentation. Um, I was prepping over the summer 
some writing for the uh, the study of progressive music's uh, conference that was supposed to be held in Ottawa in May and has been pushed to this upcoming May. And I, I sometimes find it difficult to sort of balance the instinctive uh, approach of looking at the music from the lens of Western classical and romantic, like Dr. Trout was talking about with sentence structure and the short, short, long. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about how you create that balance between that approach and this possible new approach, whether it's based in accessibility for the public or just the genre or the artist, but, but working with music that is relatively unexplored as a catalog, but also written by a living composer. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the, the short, short, long really was, uh, the, a, 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 um, a good hook for lack of a better word that can go back and forth between both worlds for, at least for my work. Um, and I think that's the key to bridging the gap you're discussing. Uh, I don't want to like wholeheartedly, you know, forget about all of the scholarship I know when I'm talking to doing a public lecture, but I'll, or, or, you know, not address what, uh, the public might think when I'm talking to a more scholarly, uh, audience. And so, um, it just so happened for my project anyway, that there was this easily recognizable short, short, long, you can hear it in scads of the songs. Uh, the words that I'm using, short, short, long, make sense and do describe what it is you're hearing, which isn't always the case in music theory. Uh, and, but then there's also this, you know, more complex mechanism that can be used to tie it to the, the classical Western tradition, and you can go down that route if you want, but you don't have to to get something out of, out of, um, out of the work that's being shown. So for, for, for me, at least, focusing on the music itself, uh, that, was, that was a big um, part of it, was the terminology, usually having this terminology that goes back and forth between the two, between the two worlds. Now, if you're, if you're looking at things from a more musicological or ethnomusicological angle, um, you'd have to turn to, to Josh or Ryan to comment on. on and I think it's a, really, it's a really great question and one that I think a lot of us in our different disciplinary areas are revisiting as we're trying to think about you know, doing all of our work, putting our best approaches forward into an anti-racist lens. Um, that this idea of, of viewing music through um, the Western tradition is is one that we're, we're all wrestling with, and I think that it's um, one that I've not come up with a good solution for. I think that's that's where we're all working and trying to do. But in terms of the stuff that we've done with Billy Joel in this volume, I think this is what I was kind of getting at a little bit earlier when I was doing the introduction piece of this is what are the different ways we can approach this music through scholarly lenses that are not necessarily informed by the Western classical canon? Um, that's a bit of a challenge with Joel and just inherently because of the ways that he talks about the music, the way he's framed it. But as you're, I think your question's alluding at is what actually can we uncover when we don't follow his lead, right? We don't take that, those trail, the bread trail that he's left for us and we, we find a new way through. Um, one of the interesting articles or at, presentations from the conference that made it through to the, the completed volume um, is this one by um, Elise Moreo uh, that looks at, it's called um, She's Got a Way, Gendered and Physical Embodiment in Interpreting Billy Joel in American Sign Language. And so it's actually taking the, <laughs> it's removing the sound, it's removing the music from it. And a lot of this is about, uh, her chapter is wonderfully written in, in the ways that it talks about um, the glosses of lyrics through American Sign Language and how how we communicate through um, through, through through you know through that that that, um, that language, and um, it I think in that realm it does remove it from any sort of kind of musical analytical Western classical perspective to give us new insights into the lyrics and language specifically of Joel. Um, and, but from there, then we can maybe. I haven't done this, and now that you're talking about it, I want to go back and reread this chapter and think about it this way, is how does that then provide us with a new angle into the music itself um, that from the insights that are gained through this embodied performance of signing language uh, lyrics at a concert? 
I remember, wasn't there one paper on time travel as well? Uh, especially like with um, scenes from an Italian restaurant where he's having this remembrance. And so th I, I thought that was a, in addition to what Ryan was just speaking about as well. I mean, there are these kind of meta topics that you can, that you can take uh, and the, the music still gives up some good stuff when you look at them from that perspective, from those perspectives. I would only add to this conversation that as valuable as it is not to follow the breadcrumbs that Billy Joel has left for us, because it is the narrative that he wants, yeah, he wants to help shape that narrative. It, I think we would be doing the scholarship a disservice if we didn't also acknowledge that that's the narrative he wants. And maybe it's a different project, maybe it's a different chapter that has yet to be written. If anybody wants to volunteer, it can be due next week. Um, but maybe th that's an it raises the interesting question of why that narrative? Why does he want us to go that way, even though we're gonna go this way? No. Is there any hesitation, Josh, when you're working with the composer that you might come up with an interpretation that he discovers at some point discovers your writing and looks at you and says no that's completely that's completely false like why would you why would you think that yeah I think there is some hesitation not that I don't then go through with it mm -hmm. uh, but in, in for my 2017 book one of the conditions of his participation was that he got to read it before publication but we made it very clear that if he objected to something he could only object to the use of his words so when I sent him and his lawyer, really, a copy of the manuscript, I highlighted every quote of his. So if they objected, we could just take the quote out. But it doesn't, it doesn't ruin the whole argument. Uh, and you know, I think that we, with this edited collection, we all had the advantage that Billy Joel already knew about the project. He was already interested and he was already supportive. He had asked us in the, inter in the keynote interview to please send him recordings of the thing. So that suggested to us that we weren't gonna meet with a whole lot of resistance. But is it in the back of my mind? Sure, because I would love to keep a, a good positive relationship with him and, and his people so that it makes future scholarship easier, even if I'm not the one to do it. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. It was so great. Uh, thank you to Ryan, Josh, Catherine, and Don.